I was talking with someone yesterday, and they were saying that in one of their early ministry opportunities, they got to teach in children's church the toddlers. <laughs> and, I, and I thought it back to the time of having toddlers and toddler grandchildren, and you get excited when they start talking, and then you want them to stop, but when they, um, <laughs> when they, when they start talking and you can begin to understand what they're saying, um, one of the, the first words that children seem to really get and you know what they mean, and it's the word mine. Um, one of the first uh, words in the vocabulary, mine. Uh, whatever it is, and no matter who else has it or wants it to the toddler, it's mine. Um, it's a shame when it happens in middle school, too. <laughs> That's mine. Um, or when it happens in adulthood. <laughs> we have stuff that's, that's ours, don't we? This is my chair. This is my place. This is my thing. This is, this is mine. And, and we, especially in America, have this concept of mine. Um, I'm reminded as we looked at the call to worship this morning in Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2, it says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. And so I have to get to the place where all that I have is his. We talk about stewardship, and I heard somebody praying this morning about stewardship, and that's what we're going to be talking about um, today and next week is, is stewardship. And um, so often, you know, as, as we're taught in church that the tithe belongs to the Lord and the 90% belongs to me, that's faulty teaching. All of it belongs to God. Everything that I have and all that I am belong to God. And, and when I begin to think that way, things begin to change in my life. It, because it's not just about money, because we're not going to be talking about money this morning. It's everything in my life, all parts of my life belong to God. My intellect belongs to God. My talents belong to God. My job belongs to God. My home belongs to God. My family belong to God. So where do I get this idea of mine? It, it, it's a world thing. And so, first of all, the world and everything in it and everyone in it belongs to God. Now, here's the thing. God has decided that he would entrust the world to us. It doesn't make the world ours. It makes us stewards of his creation. When you take your money to the bank, and it was fun doing this with, uh, with seniors, I said, you know, you're going to put money in the bank. How would you feel if you went to the bank and you went to withdraw $100 out and they told you, no, we'll give you 50, but we won't give you 100. And without my asking the next questions, kids yelled out, but it's my money. And I says, well, it's in the bank. Yes, but it's my money. I put it there. So, so what are they supposed to do with it? They're supposed to take care of my money until I need my money. And I think the same way God says, it's, it's my earth. They're my people, they're my resources, and I'm making you stewards of it. So the, the first passage we're going to go to is Genesis 1. Uh, God decided that he wanted a world, and I don't know why he decided that he wanted a world. People speculate on it. Um, somebody even said, well, well, God was lonely, so he would create it. No, I don't think that's it at all. But he did create a world, and, and the beginning of Genesis talks about those first six days of creation. And on day six, when you go to verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all of that 
over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living creature that moves on the earth. God said it's mine, but you rule it. The rule of earth belongs to you, God said. To Adam and Eve, he says, I am going to mandate that you steward all of my creation. Everything from, you'll read in in the chapter that God brought animals before Adam in chapter 2. And he says, okay, whatever you decide they're going to be called, they're going to be called. God didn't name the the, the animals. Adam did. Because God says, I'm going to let you rule over them. I'm going to let you control them. Everything that's there, they belong to you. I remember um, years ago when someone was talking about stewardship, they talked about three things that we are responsible for in stewardship. Our time, our talent, and our treasures. And that's where we're going to be um, in these next two messages. Our time, our talent, and our treasures. God says, all of these things belong to me, but I'm giving them to your charge. I'm letting you be in charge of these things. You're going to steward them. But when you steward them, keep in mind at all times, they belong to me. This is what God is saying to them, that everything that you have belongs to me. You take care of them. You can remember the first time your parents left you home alone or children, you'll get that time when your parents will leave you home um, alone. Can you remember some of the things that they said to you when they left you um, there alone? Um, You know, jokingly, we say, okay, no wild parties. And I sure hope that was a joke Um, because there wouldn't be. Um, Don't do this. Don't do that. Um, You can do this and you can do that. And if you were an old, the oldest sibling, any oldest siblings here, the, the, the oldest, um, um, you were in charge. What a feeling, huh? Um, until your siblings decided, you're not my boss. Um, but if something happened, mom or dad's not going to go to the sibling. They're coming to you. You're in charge. But, but what did you know that even though I'm in charge and I'm responsible, it's not mine? It belongs to someone else. Um, I got a um, most delightful um, letter this week. I looked at it, I smiled, and I took a picture of it. It says, we have received your last mortgage payment. And so it was like, so it's like, it's mine. It's, you know, because it's, oh, you own your house. This is now the bank and me own this house, but um, no more bank. Um, it's, it's mine. I don't have to answer to them every month. Uh, I may have shared it was before when um, I was 16, I said, I can't wait until I'm grown and I don't have to answer to anyone anymore. Oh, how sadly I was mistaken. And, and when I talked to, talk to, to seniors in high school about this, he says, what do you mean? I'm grown. I'm on my own. I says, okay, so you're going to have a house, right? I said, so either your landlord or your mortgage company will demand that you pay them every month. They're going to tell you what to do with part of your money. R, G, and E will make demands on you. Um, Your phone company will make demands on you. And they will tell you that this is what you're going to do. You can tell them that you're grown if you want. (laughs) But then they will show you where the real ownership is. And then I told them I had a two-year-old that I couldn't walk out the house without them asking me, where are you going? You know, didn't we think we were over that when we turned 18 or 19 and we moved out of the house or 20 when we moved out of the house that no one was going to ask us where we were going anymore? There was a two year old saying, where are you going? Um, and when they got older, what time are you coming back? Some of us with adult children remember the first time that we came in later than expected. And we had a child say to us, oh, you can't call, huh? Um, <laughs> If you haven't experienced that, oh, it's so much fun. And, and so now, years later, 
if we're traveling, when I get there, the first thing I do is I text and say, we've arrived safely. When I get home, I said, we've come home safely. Because if not, um, children that we raised, that we fed, that we diapered, will demand of us, why couldn't you call me? Why couldn't you do that? Um, there, there's a time when, no, there isn't any real charge that I have, and I'm never really truly independent, and I need to remember that, especially as an adult, that I'm never really independent because I have a God that I serve who requires an accountability of me. And so we're going to look at this first thing in time. And, and this was difficult to, to look at because there's so much to say. And, and, and I did some reading, and this um, Jeremy Taylor wrote The Rule and Exercise of Holy Living in 1650. And he writes, of every hour, we must give an account. God has given to man a short time here on earth, and yet upon this short time, eternity depends. But so that for every hour of life, we must give an account to the great judge of men and angels. And this is it, which our blessed Savior told us, that we must account for every idle word, not meaning that every word which is not designed to edification is less prudent, shall be reckoned a sin, but the time which we spend in our idle talking and unprofitable discoursing, that time which might and ought to have been employed for spiritual and useful purposes, this is to be accounted for. Then he says, for remember, for we must remember that we have a great work to do, many enemies to conquer, many evils to prevent, much danger to run through, many difficulties to be mastered, many necessities to serve, and much good to do, many children to provide for, and many friends to support, or many poor to relieve, and many diseases to cure. Besides the needs of nature and of relation, our private and public cares and duties of the world, which necessity of the province of God have adopted into his family of religion. All of our time is accounted for. Dorothy Bass in the book Receiving the Day says, we delude ourselves into believing that if we can just get everything done, if we can only tie up all the loose ends, if we can even once get ahead of the crush, we will prove our worth and establish ourselves in safety. Our problem with time is social, cultural, and economic to be sure but it is also a spiritual problem, one that runs right to the core of who we are as human beings. Indeed, these distortions drive us into the arms of a false theology. We, become, we come to believe that we, not God, are the masters of time. We come to believe that our worth must be proved by the way we spend our hours and that our ultimate safety depends on our own good management. And just one more. This one I enjoyed, and you'll see why. The U.S. golfer, George Archer, had a relatively successful career on the PGA Tour, winning, winning 13 tournaments, including the 1969 Masters. That's one of four majors. As he drew closer to retiring from the sport, he wasn't exactly sure how to spend his time. One reporter asked what he would do during his retirement. Archer said, Baseball players quit playing baseball and take up golf. Basketball players quit and take up golf. Football players quit and take up golf. What are we supposed to do when we quit? <laughs> Some of you have been there. I'm retired. What do I do? And, and I'm grateful that, that some of you that, that I know who have retired are still living a fruitful life. Yeah, you know, I've talked to you before that, that I was stuck last November not knowing where to go, knowing that God wasn't going to let me go back to the school district, and I really didn't want to work at a fast food restaurant, but I needed to do something. And um, then some of you started running your mouths and going to <laughs> elders and doing stuff, and here I am. But, um, but you want to know what you're going to do, and some of you, you're close. You're close to retirement. 
And some of you are wondering what I'm going to do. You're responsible to God for the time that you have. And, and you've been at the place where you wish you had more hours in the day. You ever hear yourself saying that? Man, I just wish I had more hours of the day. And some of you have wished when you were reading God's word that God would do for you what he did for Joshua. <laughs> in Joshua chapter 10, uh, just three verses, Joshua at the time, Josh, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, sun stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Joshua? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of man for the Lord fought for Israel. And so like verse 14, no, God's not going to stop the sun for you. He's not going to give you that extra day. And most of us would ask for it on a Sunday. Could you just make it last one more day, God? But think about it. What if God gave you two more hours in a day? What would you do with that two more hours? For some of us, probably a lot more busy stuff. For others of us, a lot more waste. No, God gave us 24 hours. God planned that thing so very well in the book of Genesis. And he says, I'm going to give you six days to work. And I'm going to give you a seventh day. And I want you to take that time and rest. When you get into the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, we'll see that, that God, uh, that man uh, here in the West said, six days are too much to work. Give us a 40-hour work week. Um, give us this so we can have more time to do the stuff that we want to do. And then we use that time and, and we get to the end of that time and say, man, I still need more time. I'm afraid that if God gave me a few more hours, that I would still want more. So what do we do? The book of Ephesians chapter five. Paul is writing to them, and it's a really wonderful chapter here of a wonderful book. Verses 15 and 16. And, and this right here gets very convicting for me. Paul tells the Ephesians, he says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And in that term, to walk is to govern your entire life. Look at how you govern in your entire life. Be careful, not as unwise, but as wise. And he gets a little more specific in verse 16 when he says, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. I don't have to convince you of how evil the days are. I don't have to convince you that there is little time to waste because of what's going on around us. God doesn't want us in, in, in these times that we're living in to, to sit back in our homes and cower because of the things that are going on. He doesn't want us even to, to sit there and complain about all the horrible things going on. I mean, talk about moral bankruptcy. We used to hear about those terms and, and hear about how certain people are morally bankrupt. And, and somehow those people have gotten into leadership in our country at every level. Some of the laws that, that are being passed, and, and every so often I'll get to, to hear on the radio and, and hear a couple of, of Christian lobbyists talk about things happening in, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, their capital, and in Albany. And some of the stuff that's there, and, and I had to say, God, um, I have not been keeping up with what's there, and I haven't been able to pray about these evil times. When I look at the things that are being introduced to our schools and, and, and the, the, the garbage, the things that are so very ungodly that are being introduced into our schools and given to our children at a very young age, when they're allowing people who have no educational background uh, people who have no medical background, uh, no psychological background, to come in and talk to our children, young children, about gender identification. 
and parents are supposed to just take it. Where in New York, I believe it passed, where a middle schooler can say, I want to have a gender shift, and I can do it without mom. I can do it without dad. Um, I, I heard the, the conversation. Now, I have to check on whether it's been passed, but just heard somebody mention that th this is what they've done in New York. I know they want to do it, where a 12-year-old can't get their ear pierced, um, they can't stay out after certain hours, but they can say, I want a gender change. Something wrong with that. Uh, the, the, the governments um, in many states want to take over the responsibility of parents. These are wicked times. And so in wicked times, how are we handling our time? He says, make the best use of them. He, he says, and the, the King James says, redeem the time. To, to buy up the time, to make a wise and sacred use of every opportunity for doing good. Um, the writer says, so that zeal and well-doing are as it were the purchase money by which we make the time our own. He says, make use of it. This time he's talking about our seasons, not, not one o'clock, two o'clock, but we are in a time where things are evil. And God says, what are you doing with your time, your hours, in this evil season that we have? And going back to Ephesians 5 and 17, he says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And he says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And, and, and we say, well, I don't drink, but we... We give into ourselves so many other things that do the same thing that alcohol would do. Um, I am so glad that God has given me um, this really weird tongue for alcohol. Um, I, I can't stand the taste of alcohol. Um, every time somebody gives me something to sip, it's like, man, this is like coracidin. Um, and that's what it tastes like. And, and who wants to, to take coracidin if you're not sick? And, and that's how alcohol tastes to me, and, and I'm glad um, that it does, because I told um, someone that when my last few years of teaching, if I had a taste for alcohol, I would have numbed myself after school a whole lot of days. And so I don't have it. But we get drunk with other stuff. N not physically drunk, but uh, what, does, what does alcohol do to some people? And you've seen some people drunk, and, and maybe in, in your past life, Hopefully, your past life, you've been there. You've been there. You've been smashed out of your mind, and you know that you can't function, and you're not good for anything. There are things that we fill our minds with, and we fill our spirit with, that take that same kind of effect in our lives as alcohol does. And Paul says, don't get yourself overwhelmed and controlled by any external thing, but be filled with the Spirit of God that the Holy Spirit should be filling me. And, and it's interesting that he talks about being filled with the Spirit at the same time he talks about making the best of our time. And so if I'm going to control and manage myself with my time, then I need to be filled with the Spirit of God. And so I was, was looking at, at how, how do you help someone with using their time wisely? And that's a struggle that I continue to have. You know, there are only 24 hours in the day, and I know that I'm going to sleep from six to eight of those hours. And what am I going to do with the rest of those hours that I have to be productive? I'm going to eat in some of those times. I'm going to, to, to clean myself in, in some of the, that time. I'm going to work in that time. And, and I remember saying before, I just don't have the time. I remember talking with students and my own children when they were in middle school about not having enough time. And when I looked up um, an article that says how to use your time wisely, the first thing they said was track your time for at least a week. Track your time. Now, you get home from school at 3.30. So from 3.30 until you go to bed, track every half an hour. What do you do between 3.30 and 4? What do you do between 4 and 4.30? on until 9 o'clock when most of them were in bed. And I had students say, I couldn't believe how much time I wasted. I can't believe how much time I spent doing things other than what I was supposed to do. 
He said, you know, I always said I don't have enough time to do my homework, but I had enough time. I just did other stuff. And now I wonder how, how we as adults, when if we go away from home to work and we come back in between four, five, six, seven in the evening and the time that we go to bed, how do we spend that time? So let's track it. Because I think a lot of us will find out that we have a whole lot more time than we thought we had. And then he says, identify and eliminate bad habits or time stealers. Um, this thing right here can be sacred or it can be a stealer of my time. Um, I, I've gotten rid of most of the games on there, but I have a couple that just kind of settle my, my mind. Um, and, and I had to get rid of the competition ones because I'm a very competitive person. And so if there's something that you can win something and you're competing against others and you can win, oh, you got me then. And so I had to get rid of them off of my phone and off of the iPad. And, and one of the things that says, okay, I'm going to use this one day a week. Um, for me, sometimes I just need something just to mellow the mind. And, and I use, but how much time do I spend on it? Um, I remember when, when Candy Crush first came out. Um, oh, I got some candy crushers out there. Um, and and I, I remember talking to people and I said, you know, what level are you on? And they were in the tens of thousands and levels. And it was like, are you kidding me? Um, first of all, there was a jealousy because I couldn't get past a certain point. Um, but then it was like, I knew how much time it took me just to get there. And then I knew people who spent good money on buying extra stuff so that they could get to there. But so you wasted money and you wasted time. And when you got to that next level, you may have had a personal sense of satisfaction. But what difference does it make in the world? Then it says, organize your workspace to eliminate time sinks. And he talked about how if your desk isn't organized or your workbench isn't organized or your truck isn't organized or whatever you work in isn't organized, you waste time. Um, now, I had an organizational system that nobody else understood. And there were some times where I would have a well-meaning student that if I wasn't in my class and another class was meeting in there, um, thought, Mr. Johnson's desk needs to be a whole lot neater than this. And they straightened up my desk and I couldn't find a thing. It looked good, but what I did have found out was one person said, don't lay anything on your desk. Get something where it can stand up. Put it in a file folder, stand it up. And I must say, in a bit of pride, that since December, my desk has been cleaned. <laughs> That's a huge thing for me. I have never gone six months with a clean, I've never gone six days with a clean desk. I, I made it to four one, one year. Um, but it does help. I can find stuff. Now, one of the things I did find out also is if you put stuff in a folder, label the folder, or you're going through all of the folders trying to find something, just practical stuff. Um, make a list of goals. In school, we were teaching students about goals, and we talked about SMART goals. Um, an acrostic, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. For example, um, a few years ago during COVID, when I, was, I went to school to teach instead of teaching from home, and um, we had an hour and a half break during the day, an hour for lunch and then a half an hour screen time. And it's like, okay, I'm the only one on the third floor. What do I do? So I started walking a half an hour, and I needed to do it because the first three weeks being at home, I picked up seven pounds because every break, the kitchen called me, and the refrigerator and the cabinet, and those things called me. And, um, and then I sat while I taught. And, and so I went to school, and, and so I walked for half an hour. And, and then I began to, to walk some and jog some, and walk some and jog some, and, and until you know, the heart floor was bad on my knees, so I went um, to Planet Fitness, and, and I got on the treadmill, and then I set a goal, I said, um, it was in the spring. I said, by my birthday, I want to jog a 5K. Now, I've told you before that um, my philosophy with running was if you're not chasing me, I don't need to run. So um, I said, I'm going to jog this. And so how was I going to do it? I I'm going to, to jog this much and then walk this much. I'm going to jog this much and walk this much. And months before my birthday that year, I finished my first 5K. Man, that was so good. 
And then before plantar fasciitis decided that I didn't need to run anymore, um, I did three 5Ks in a week. Um, when, and, and it took me until my 60s to do it. Um, why? Because I said, this is something I want to do. Now, that's something that to you is like, I don't care about that, but what is it that you've been wanting to do? Or more importantly, what is it that God has wanted you to do and have you made a plan for it? Then he says, use a calendar and schedule to plan. Categorize, here's a big one, categorize tasks based on their urgency or importance. The urgent sometimes steals so much of our time. And then we find out what we thought was urgent really wasn't all that important, and life would have gone on even without it. Moving on, do an important task when you have the most energy. If you want to get the best out of me, then you want me between 5 a.m. and noon. Um, the rest of the, the, the next four hours are a struggle for me. What's your timing? I mean, because some of you, if I got you to a meeting at 5 o'clock, I might have your body, but that's all I'm going to have. Well, what's your most productive time? And you need to figure that out. Um, delegate tasks you don't need to do yourself. Um, some of us can remember when our parents delegated dishes to us and delegated cleaning that place to us because they could do something else. And I like nine, block out time for family and friends. Keep your focus in the moment and take frequent breaks to keep your mind fresh. The, the, there are tons of articles out there if you're struggling with time because you will not find a chapter and verse to tell you how to do this specifically. You find stuff, you ask God, how do you want me to do this? Which ones of these things will help me? Why? Because I am responsible to God for my time. I, I do believe that God's going to hold me accountable for the time and how did I use it? What are your priorities? I, I, I don't know what God has called you to do specifically, but I do know that God has called you to pray. God has called you to spend time in his word, reading it, meditating on it, memorizing it, and doing it. And God has called you to share your life in some way that impacts his kingdom. Those things I know. The other specifics, you got to talk to God about those things. I remember um, hearing a poem when... I was probably 10. Um, I have a couple of aunts who were into poetry, and they would give recitals where they would sing, and it would give. And I heard this one, and I memorized it. And I couldn't remember because I don't know who the author is, but I remembered so much of it that I just put the lines in Google, and it gave me the poem. And I memorized this thing about 55 years ago, 60 years, 55 years ago. And it's called What Do You Do? It says, have you made someone happy or made someone sad? What have you done with the day that you had? God gave it to you to do just as you would. Did you do what was wicked or do what was good? Did you hand out a smile or just give them a frown? Did you lift someone up or push someone down? Did you lighten some load or some progress impede? Did you look for a rose or just gather a weed? What did you do with your beautiful day? God gave it to you. Did you throw it away? Um, wow, that was convicting. Even as a, what, 10-year-old? Um, I knew that was a, a really great time waster then. Got in a lot of trouble for wasting time and not getting done what I was supposed to be getting done when I was supposed to. And so my challenge to you in this area of time is to give it to God and, and to sit down before him and say, God, show me how to fill up my calendar. Someone said some years ago, um, I can take two things that belong to you and tell you a lot about your spiritual life. I'm thinking, yeah. He said, what is that? He says, your calendar and your checkbook. He says, those things say so much about you and your priorities. And I felt good about, about the checkbook at the time, but I didn't feel good about the calendar. And I had to go to God and say, here's my calendar, God. Show me how to use it. I've had to do that very much in, in the last few months. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of urgent that, um, that cries out for my calendar. And there's a lot of important. 
And, and how do you, you weigh those two things? You go to God and you say, you got to teach me. Some things are obvious. Other things aren't so obvious. And so whatever it is in, in your calendar at this time of your life, whether you're still working a full-time job um, away from home or, or all your work is from home, you have that day. You have that 24 hours. What are you doing that's going to impact the kingdom of God? Scene two, number two, your talents or your gifts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I, I'm hoping that I can just read through this. Probably not, but let's give it a try. Paul says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. And then he says in verse 4, 12, 4, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Listen to verse 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. If you are a born-again child of God, you have at least one spiritual gift. He goes and talks about them, and we'll look at spiritual gifts in a few months. He says, all these are empowered by one and the same spirit who listens, apportions to each one individually as he wills. The spirit of God says, I'm going to give you this gift. 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 Why? So that you can help build the body of Christ so that you can impact the kingdom, so that you can see people coming to Jesus and be discipled. He says, that's why I'm giving you gifts. I'm not giving you the gifts so you can look good. I'm not giving you the gifts so you can feel good. There's kingdom work to be done. And, and just like, like God says that I've given you dominion over the earth, God says, I'm using you to build my kingdom. And each one of us that's a part of the body of Christ each one of us has a part to play. How are you handling that gift that God's given you? And again, when we talk about this in the future, we'll talk about some ways of helping you to find what that spiritual gift is. One of the easiest ways is to, to, to get busy in the kingdom of God, whether it's in church or in some way of, you, of doing something that's going to impact the kingdom. Something that your heart says, man, I would really enjoy doing that, or, or that looks like something that, that would be really helpful for me to do, and start doing it. You'll find out, like, like some of us, that we had spiritual gifts that we weren't even aware of, but it was active. And someone, I remember somebody saying to me, you have this spiritual gift. The, the teaching one was obvious, and I knew that at an early age. Um, as, I, I, as I taught Sunday school and I, I counseled at camp, which was a lot of teaching and, and, and taught in, in other places, that was easy. That was the one that I enjoyed. That's what I wanted to do. But somebody says, you know what? You're an exhorter. You use your teaching to, to do that, but you're an exhorter. And I said, what in the world is that? And I had to look it up. But there were people in the body who knew and said, so this is what it is. And then I began to see, yeah, that's correct. It is. But if I would have sat on the sideline and done nothing... No one would have been able to tell what that gifting was. No one could tell what your talents are until you start doing it. We, we have an, an amazing daughter um, who does stuff that we don't understand. Um, a few years ago, she started doing these, these wonderful acrylic paintings. And, and I looked at Cheryl and said, you remember this? And she said, no, I don't remember this. And, and then she started working um, with wood. And, um, and, and she's still ex excited about the stuff that she's doing with wood. Her last things was turning pens. So she makes pens and gets fillings in it, and, and she loves doing that. She's made me bowls. She made me um, a, a holder for my, um, my filters. She made me my coffee table. She does, I mean, she does all of that stuff. If, she all, if all she did was work all day or just sat around, 
she would have never known the talents and the skills that she has. Some of you have amazing skills. If all you ever did was sit around and watch television, you would have never known it. But you started doing things. Some of you were with a person from another generation, a parent or, or a relative or a neighbor or a teacher, and you began to watch them and you began to do something and you learned that you were really good at that. And it works that same way in the kingdom of God. He's gifted you. Now start doing so you can figure out what that gifting is. So some of you, it will, it will be like, like me with, with that teacher, that, that teaching thing that from the time I was 10, that's what I wanted to do. And then as I got older, I said, I want to use this in the church also. And, and God began to use that as I got training. Um, I shared with the young people last evening that when, when you're you know, related to the pastor, you got to do things younger than other people got to do them. Um, and so I went through teacher training when I was 12. And then I got a mentor who, who taught me how to teach. And then I went through it again with my peers uh, in, in order to, to get better at that thing that I did. And so I got the training, and then the opportunities were presented, and God opened doors. What are you doing with the gifting that you have? One of the things that we're looking at in the near future is um, a ministry fair. We're going to preach on spiritual gifts. And then we're going to say, this is what's available at Journey. Where does God want you? COVID put a lot of us on the sidelines. And it's time to get off the sidelines and into the game. And we're going to give you those opportunities. And we're going to give you the encouragement. We'll give you a training, whatever you need to be uh, fruitful in the work that God has for you to do. But let me remind you of a parable. In Matthew chapter 25, last passage. And this kind of fits um, both of those areas of, of money and skill. Verse 14, Jesus tells a parable. I'm learning how to wait for pages to stop. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them his property. To one he gave five talents. That's an amount of money. That's not skills. That's not gifting. That's money. He gave five talents to another two and to another one to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them, and he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master... You delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five more talents. Verse 21, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. 22, and he also who had the two talents came forward and said, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what's yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I have gathered where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money in the bankers with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast that worthless servant into the outer darkness. 
and the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow, that seems harsh. <laughs> but this person that Jesus talks about in this parable says, I- I've given you. And in the same way, the Father has given to us gifts. He's given to us skills and abilities. Are we using them to the fullest? Or have we hidden them? Have we dug a pit and says, you know what, I'm afraid. Or I don't have enough. Or do you fall into the mistake of comparing yourself to others? Do you hear yourself saying, I I could never do what this person is doing. I could never do what that person is doing. I I remember feeling the call of God on my life to to preach. And I said, no, God, because at that time, I think we had six preachers in the family. And all of them were good. That's where I got my love for, for, for listening to preaching was from hearing people who preach the word of God. And... I said, no, not me. I said, God, I stutter in front of people. I can't speak. I can't read in front of people. I read well by myself, but I I can't do these things. And I'm glad that the Spirit of God was patient, but then he made it urgent. And the conviction was heavy. God doesn't want you comparing yourself to anyone. He's given you a gift. And the same Spirit who's gifted me and enabled me will do the same for you or is doing the same for so many of you as I see you minister around here. So what are we doing with them? If you have a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus, he holds you accountable for your stewardship. If you don't know Jesus, he doesn't want your time. He doesn't want your talent. He doesn't want your treasures. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants to change your heart, and once he's changed your heart, once you've become his child, then he'll do those other things. You're one of two places. Are you pleased with what God is doing in you and through you? Or do you need to go to him saying, not been a good steward, but from this moment on, I'm going to steward your gifts. I'm going to steward what you've given to me for the praise of your glory. Ban, would you come up? Father, thank you for your word. I began to realize why I struggled with this so much this week, because I had to live it. I had to deal with, I had to confess and repent where I have not used my time well, where I'm not sure if I've always got the most out of the gifting that you've given. But I thank you for your spirit who leads, who teaches and guides. That brings us to the place where we confess our sins. You're faithful and just to forgive them, us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and then give us the opportunity to walk in obedience to you. Oh, that we would be good stewards. Um, not only because we want to hear it, but, yeah, because we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name, amen.